And uh, Ellen, are you ready? Okay. We can start recording now. Oh, one last thing. <laughs> <laughs> one last thing. Uh, want you to write down your name. Uh, pass around a notepad. Uh, one reason is that one of the handouts uh, there fill links to other articles. So if I have your name, I know who who a person today. So I can send you an email and send you the, the links. All right. That's how it Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Choi. Uh, it is a, a blessing and uh, uh, an honor to be here today. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I've been uh, involved in church ministry for over 40 years, most of the time doing exactly what I'm doing today, and that is teaching and training teachers how to teach the Bible. And uh, it's a joy to uh, just to be here today. Uh, my wife, uh, she's been real involved in the music aspect of, of church life, and she feels as called to the ministry as I do. And uh, for that, I'm so grateful. We have two daughters, one who lives in Midtown, and they have two uh, sons, and they started a church called Neighborhood Church in the Midtown area about 10 years ago, and it's going great. Another daughter out in Oakland, uh, Tennessee, and her husband is a nurse practitioner. They also have two grand, two kids, four grandkids, and from uh, four to thirteen years of age. So uh, we retired a couple years ago, moved to Memphis. Never thought we'd move to Memphis, but uh, God let, let us here, and uh, we are so grateful. And we, right now, I'm working with Dr. Mitch Martin, who is head of the, the Baptist Association in this area. 180 churches that he works with, and I'm helping him work with pastors to encourage pastors and also to train uh, Sunday school teachers and uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump right in. Lord thank you for this time today. Lord we give you praise. We want to honor you today. We pray that your precious Holy Spirit would teach uh, today. Lord that uh, the words that I say pray that you would just uh, bless them and the hearts of these people that are here today, and they would apply these principles to their area of, of leadership, whether they're teaching children or youth or adults or senior adults, or maybe they're uh, uh, the president of a class. Lord, I pray that they'd be able to apply these principles to make this, their Sunday school, even a better, better class and a better uh, able to... Uh, reach people for Jesus. Lord, we uh, give you the praise and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Everybody got the sheet that says Sunday school that makes a difference or uh, group Bible study that makes a difference. Got a, got a um, deal on, on the corner here. There we go. There we go. Collated. There we go, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, this is what I'm going to be using today with the PowerPoint to, uh, to teach uh, how to have a uh, Sunday school that makes a difference in people's lives. And that's, that's what we want, isn't it? Uh, we don't want to just come and study the Bible like it's a history book, although that's, that's okay, that's good. But we want to see people's lives changed for the glory of God. There's three things I'm going to be talking about here today. One is the word invite. The word invite. The next is the word discover. And the third is the word connect. Uh, if your Sunday school class didn't invite anybody uh, to, their, to your class, it wouldn't be long before you wouldn't have anybody there, right? So the inviting aspect of growing a great Sunday school class is so important. And if you did invite people, had lots of people, but yet you didn't really teach the Word that well, and you never really discovered the power of God's Word and the power of, of the Bible, then that wouldn't help us either. Then the third is the idea of connecting. Connecting with one another in living life. Connecting with people that are hurting. You heard the pastor today, he just did an awesome job about looking around and being aware of people that are hurting. There's people that are hurting in your Sunday school class or they're friends of people in your Sunday school class. 
and the connecting aspect is, is so important. Invite, discover, and connect. And we're going to jump in with invite right now. Okay, in the Bible, uh, one of the first uh, things that Jesus did right as he started his earthly ministry was he had to recruit 12 guys, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, these 12 guys, they were all lawyers and doctors and highly educated people. Is that right? No. 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 They were ordinary, run-of-the-mill people of the day. Andrew was one of the very first that he invited to come follow him. Now, Andrew, what do we know about Andrew? Somebody tell us a little bit about Andrew. What? Fisherman. Anybody? Fisherman. He's a fisherman probably, yeah. Uh, yeah. Peter's brother. He was Peter's brother. Okay. What do we know about Peter? Fisherman. Fisherman, what else? <laughs> Doesn't have a lot of fish. Got a lot of fish? Was he a quiet, kind of reserved guy? No, man. He, he, was, he was a take charge kind of guy. He, what did he do? He cut off with somebody's ear. Yeah, and he probably wasn't going for the ear. He was probably going for his head. And the guy ducked and he got his ear. But anyway, Peter was just an outgoing guy. Upon this rock I will build my church, you know. But Andrew? Quiet, reserved, probably to himself. But what did Andrew do? Messenger. Once he decided he was going to follow Jesus, first thing he did was he looked around and said, Who else do I know that needs Jesus? And he said, Hey, Peter, you're not going to believe this, man, but I, I'm following this Jesus person. And he is going to be the savior of the world. And he brought Peter to know Jesus. Right? Okay. Who do you know in your family? In your family that doesn't know Jesus? Just raise your hand if you have somebody in your family that doesn't know Jesus. Wow, look at that. Look at that. Okay. Fantastic. Jesus is, is, is imploring us, those of us that raised our hands, to invite our family member to church, to your Sunday school class, to become a follower of Jesus, just like Andrew did. What about Matthew? What about Matthew? Let me know about Matthew. Huh? Tax collector. He was what? Tax collector. Tax collector. I thought you said back scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> tax collector, yeah. He was a tax collector. Uh, how many of y'all really love the IRS? You love the IRS, right? Raise your hand, come on now. You love I think I get a refund. You get the refund, okay, all right, yeah. Yeah, we actually have people working for IRS. Oh, I better be better. <laughs> in that case, uh, yeah. No. <laughs> Matthew was a tax collector. He was not liked. Why? Because he was what? Money. He took money. He took more than he was supposed to. Absolutely. And the people knew it, but that couldn't do anything about it. Then all of a sudden, Matthew, Jesus comes to Matthew and says, Hey, Matt. I want you to be my follower. I want you to follow me. I want you to become a fisher of men. What did Matthew do? Immediately he started and began to follow Jesus. He became a Jesus follower. What did Matthew do after he became a Jesus follower? Recruited other people? He gave it back. He gave it back? That was one indication that it was real. Yeah, and somebody back here? I said he recruited others. He recruited others. How did he go about recruiting others? He had a party at his home. He had a party. <laughs> Us have a party. <laughs> Any party people in here? <laughs> yeah. Got you. Got you. Okay, yeah. Any people who don't like parties? Uh, probably a few. <laughs> a few. Okay, that's all right. Matthew, who was a tax collector, invited all of his unchurched tax collector friends 
to a party. And then what did he do? He invited Jesus mm -hmm. to come to the party. You think there were many Jesus followers at the party at the beginning? No, probably not. But Jesus came, and I'm sure there were many Jesus followers at the end of the party. What did he do? He invited. Matthew invited. Andrew invited. He invited. There's a sheet that you you got. About a, it's an outline of a book by Tom Rainer. Tom Rainer used to be the head of Lifeway or Southern Baptist Sunday School uh, organization in Nashville. I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but you can read it there. He did a, a survey of about a thousand unchurched people, used college kids, seminary kids to do the survey, and came up with these statistics that 80%. 80% of our unchurched friends will say yes if you ask them to go to church with you. They'll say yes the first time. 80% will. And about 35%, and I get, don't know the exact numbers, so they're on your sheet. About 35% are very interested. I mean, they are interested in following Jesus. Okay? But they're just out there. They're kind of doing their thing, you know, going to Grizzly game, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, likes Penny Hardaway and all this and working and, all, you know, life goes on. But if you, as a friend, invite them to come to Easter Sunday, guess what? 80% of your friends will come with you on Easter Sunday. Eighty percent of your unchurched friends would come the first time. Now, will they come back a second time? Depends on what they find when they get here. <laughs> this is a loving church. I walked in here, and I mean, people started shaking my hand. Some of them knew who I was. Some, some of them didn't. I mean, just sweet fellowship. Wonderful. Uh, as I walked down the hall, people were so warm and helpful. This is a wonderful church, folks. Don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted. And you right here in this room, you make that happen. Not the pastor, the, every one of these folks right here. You make it a warm, loving, caring, inviting kind of church. Okay? All right. But you've got to invite people uh, to, uh, to grow a church, have a healthy church, have a healthy Sunday school class. Okay? Any questions on this 80% thing? Because that's, that, that, some of y'all are kind of looking at me like, you know, what? I don't, I'm not sure I believe that. Until you said the first time. <laughs> first time. Yes. First time. They'll come with you. They'll say yes. And you may have to go pick them up. You may have to hey, say, hey, we'll go to lunch after Easter Sunday, dinner, church, whatever. But 80% will come the first time. And then hopefully they'll come back and come to the point of putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Any other thoughts on the 80 or questions on the 80%? Read that page on your own discretion as you get ready for Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is the 21st of April, something like that. It's on the tail end of April. Folks, everybody's looking for a place to go to church on Easter. Most of 90% of the population is looking for a church to go to on Easter Sunday. They may not come to your Sunday school class, but they'll come to worship. Okay, what kind of people are we inviting? What kind of folks are we inviting? I was uh, assistant pastor at First Baptist Dexter, Missouri. Southeast Missouri, small town, about 12,000. We had a church running about 500, and I mean, it was just lots of neat things going on, and lots of stuff going on with the young people. We had lots of real active youth group. This was back in the, in the mid-80s. <coughs> and... Uh, there was three boys, all brothers, started coming to our church, and uh, but mom and dad didn't didn't attend. And so we got to working with these three boys, and a couple of them trusted Jesus as their savior, and uh, but uh, couldn't get mom and dad to come. 
And uh, Mike was the dad's name. And so I, I, I'm an outdoor kind of guy. I, I like to fish. I like to hunt, that kind of stuff. I just I was born and raised in the Ozarks of Missouri, and, I, and that's, that's kind of how I was raised. And so I, I enjoy nature. So I found out that Mike was a duck hunter. And so uh, I got to connect with him. He owned a Napa Auto Parts store, the edge of town. I needed some parts for something one day, so I went to Mike's Auto Parts store. I bought some and, and tried to talk to him a little bit and connected and kind of connected with the duck hunting deal. And he knew that I was the the uh, assistant pastor at the church, so he he wasn't real warm towards me. But uh, anyway, I said, "Hey, man, your boys are coming to church. Why don't you come with?" Um. Uh, Maybe, you know, he kind of just blew me off. Well, these boys kept coming to church. And then one day, Mike invites me to go duck hunting with him. So I said, yes. Get up early before daylight, you know, we're out there wading in the water and the ducks start flying and we're shooting ducks and all this kind of But the language in the duck line, folks, was awful. <laughs> I mean, terrible. I, I, I'm not a prude by any means, but I heard words that I didn't even know what they were. So, and I knew they were cuss words. So I, I just didn't say anything. I just quiet, you know, shoot a duck every now and then. And the big thing about duck hunting is you eat breakfast right there in the blind. they got a little hot meal going on. they got sausage and, and you know, so I, I enjoyed breakfast. And it, was, it was a great time. Got done, went to, you know, I was at church the next Sunday, and Mike shows up. <laughs> Mike, you know, and everybody at church, Mike Thurston's here, man, Mike Thurston's here. And I think, the roof's going to cave in. No, <laughs> that kind of deal. And, uh, you know, his boys, his three boys kept after him. Dad, Mom, you're going to love this church, man. They just do some neat things, and the preacher's... The preacher's funny, and he makes makes the sermons whether you can apply them to your life. And all three of these boys kept inviting his dad, their dad, to come. So finally, Mike came, and he came back a second time, and he came back a third time, and the fourth time, he walks down the aisle. Tears. I mean, just everybody in the whole church was crying. You know, he was that kind of guy. Because everybody knew that he was a coarse guy. He was a dirty joke-telling guy. He was a very selfish guy. He was very unkind. And yes, he was the town drunk. And he was uncaring. And he was very worldly. And he was a womanizer. That was Mike. But we kept inviting him. We kept talking to him. We didn't just ask him one time. We asked him many times. And that was in 1983, folks. Today, Mike, I know, was at First Baptist Church, Dexter, Missouri, running a TV camera and probably had a couple of his buddies there with him that he had invited to church. God totally changed his life. And, and here's what was so funny. Here's what was so funny. Of course, Mike had lots of friends. Duck hunting friends, auto park friends, you know, in the town, that kind of stuff. He'd grown up there. Everybody knew him. His friends started taking bets. Hey, how long is this church thing going to last? You know? <laughs> One week, a month, three months. Well, everybody that bet against Mike lost money because he's still serving God and loves the Lord. But this is the kind of person that we're trying to reach. This guy right here even. <laughs> I need cash for alcohol. And the guy's honest, isn't he? <laughs> Sure, yeah. But also, this is the kind of person that we're trying to reach also. You know what? Having a healthy church and having a growing church, folks, can sometimes get pretty messy. It's not just, you know, everything's great and wonderful and hunky-dory. Because when you start reaching these kind of folks and the kind of folks like Mike Thurston, it gets messy. You've got to love on people just like what the preacher preached on today. You've got to love them to Jesus and do things for them, with them. You know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big outdoor guy, but 
you know what? I was really uncomfortable in that duck blind that day. <clears throat> I really was. But I, I, I sat through it. I loved on him. I thanked him for inviting me. You know, we had a good time. But I was un it was messy. That, that's not how I do life, you know, as a Christ follower. But I was there to love on him and to try to get him to Jesus. Now maybe you have some friends that are close to this guy. I don't know. You might have. If you do, invite them to church on Easter. Okay? Invite them to church on Easter. Okay. Relationships determine the growth and the morale of Sunday school. Relationships, your relationships, your friendships determine... Uh, the morale of your Sunday school class. If you're in touch with your folks uh, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, if you do life with them in your Sunday school class, it makes a tremendous difference. I remember my daughter, who now is uh, married and helped start the church there in neighborhood church in Midtown. Her senior year in high school, uh, we were in St. Louis, but her Sunday school teacher would call her about twice a month. Would call my 12th grade daughter. They had a relationship. They had a relationship. Okay? And I mean, even to this day, my daughter holds that teacher in very high regard because of the relationship that they had. Relationships are so important. It goes beyond just showing up on Sunday morning Opening the Bible and teaching and, you know, that kind of thing. You build relationships. Do things together. My Sunday school teacher <laughs> at First Baptist Millington, he's a retired submariner, Navy guy. You know, I mean, he, he but he loves the Lord and uh, he, he's, he's, but we'd been there about six months and guess what? He calls me up and says, hey, Howard, you want to go fishing? Uh, yeah, yeah, man, well, let's go. <clears throat> he was building a relationship with me, even though I was, quote, a retired minister. Uh, but uh, he, he was wanting to build that relationship, and he does that periodically with, with a lot of the men in, in the class. Okay, this is one right here that it's a little bit different. New members usually fit better in a new class. If you have new members attending and becoming people becoming new members, usually they will fit better in a new class. Not always. Linda and I, we plugged into a, a class there at First Baptist Billington, and we just fit right in and had a great time. But a lot of times, it's hard to fit into a group that's already been formed. People that already have relationships and friendships, it's hard for them to kind of uh, break the ice, so to speak. So that's something to think about. Coming into Easter, and if you're looking at having several new people attend, that kind of thing, maybe new people joining, uh, start, think about starting a new class. Now, I don't want to split one of the existing classes. No, I, that's not a good idea. But start a new class with new people. Okay? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. So, uh, right now, Especially on the other side, we're very small. Um, I don't think that we had a bandwidth to start a new class. Um, half our class teaches some some Sunday school class, so only half the English side today, which you saw is just yes, only half. Okay. So it would be hard for us to start a, a new class. Okay, but the new people probably would fit into your class very easily okay. because your class is small. I'm talking about an existing class that's probably got you know, 12, 15, 20 people already attending. It's hard for a new person to plug in to that group of, of, of 12 to 15 to 20. Where you've got four, five, no, six. This morning we had, what? we had about 10, didn't we? Did you have 10? Mm -hmm. Ten's a good group for the new people to plug into. Because these 10, the, oh, somebody new. you got 20 people in the class. Somebody new come in and they don't even know it. <laughs> oh, is there somebody new here today? Yeah. But with just eight or ten people in the class, somebody new walk in, everybody knows, hey, that new person. Yeah. And they want to get to know that person. Yeah. That's a good good thought, good question. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, teachers do not like to party. Partiers do not like to teach. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah? Now, my Marine, uh, excuse me, uh, Navy, Submariner, Sunday School teacher, guess what? If we put him in charge of the party, we would never have a party. <laughs> but at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, at two minutes after, <clears throat> turn in your Bibles. So, you know, he's ready to go. And we know that. And guess what? We are there at 9 o'clock. Most of the class there are ready to go. But he is not a party guy. So we don't put him in charge of the party. His wife is a party girl. So a lot of times she, she plans the party. But that's just something to keep in mind, okay? And uh, a lot of times the, the person that is the teacher, you know, we like to study the Word. We like to apply the Word. We like to, you know, teach. And, and sometimes we are not the party person, okay? There's somebody in your class that is, and parties make a difference in your class. We're talking about relationships, okay? We're talking about building relationships. And a lot of times, like our class, we'll go to lunch on Sunday after church. We'll text everybody and say, hey, okay, we're going to uh, Zaxby's, and everybody want, can, can be there. Show up. That's a party. That's considered a party. We do that. We do some type of a party once a month. And the class is growing, doing great, and we love each other, okay? Okay, growing classes have a party every month, and you put the party person in charge. Now, the party person may forget about the party, party person may, oh, that was last week, or oh, this is next week, you know, that sometimes they're a little bit scatterbrained, but that's okay, you still put them in charge, and let two or three of the party people plan it, and it'll be fun, it'll be exciting, everybody will have a great time. Uh, people will come to the party sometimes before they'll come to Bible study, okay, all right, again, we're talking about building relationships, by to the party, I <coughs> was a uh, Education minister, first Baptist Paducah, right before I retired. I was at 12 years. And uh, in about my sixth year, there was a couple that got saved, and I led them to the Lord in my office. They were about to get a divorce, and it was a long story anyway. But they had been working at uh, uh, one of the big factories in Lexington, Kentucky, and for 20 years they had worked night shift. Their body clock was such that they didn't wake up till 12, 1 o'clock in the middle of the day. Okay? I didn't understand that, but that was real to them. They'd stay up until 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, go to bed. Then they'd wake up about 11, 12 o'clock in the middle of the day. Well, they get saved and they're gung-ho about following the Lord. I said, well, you need to get plugged into Sunday school. Okay, what's that? Well, that's Bible study that we meet at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. All right, we can't come at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. We've just gone to bed. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I guess you just, and they start coming. They were every Sunday night to church. Never miss Sunday night church. Anyway, after about a couple months, I met with them and tried to help them in the walk of the Lord. I said, Karen, could you start a Sunday school class on Sunday evening, like at 5 o'clock? Okay, now, I'm, I'm the guy at church that's in charge of Sunday school. I'm in charge of starting new classes. And they're actually asking me to start class at 5 o'clock on Sunday. Well, I couldn't get any, find anybody to teach. Terrible time to have Bible study. 5 o'clock on Sunday. So I started. They came. Immediately we had, had 6, 8 people that started coming on a regular basis. I mean, it, we had some great times. I taught for six years until I actually retired and moved here. But, Christmas party? Christmas party? Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Come on back here. The Christmas party? We'd have 15 people show up. But for 5 o'clock Sunday Bible study, it was a good crowd if we had 8 or 9. <laughs> but they come to the Christmas party. They had fun, and we had a great time at the Christmas parties and the other parties we had during, during the year. But, come Bible study time, uh, it was 8 to 10 at the most. So just keep that in mind. 
Okay, this is a picture in the background of a birthday party. I don't know if you can tell it or not. There's three things here I want us to look at. One, successful salespeople are the ones who ask seven, eight, and nine times. They don't just give up after they've asked twice. Anybody here in sales? Okay, we've got a salesman here, we've got a sales lady here, we've got a salesperson, Ooh, somebody. Surely there's more people in sales. I'm in sales. I'm selling the gospel. Okay, all right, okay. What kind of sales are you in? Uh, medical device. Medical device. What kind of sales are you in? HVAC and plumbing. What? <laughs> Start to say, when I built my house, my plumber didn't. Uh, you weren't my plumber. <laughs> cool, all right. Okay, you're in sales. Uh, when you first time somebody says no, what do you do? I ask... Uh, um, you got two or three or four I questions asked, uh, don't you? Yeah. Some comments, feedback. Yeah. yeah, give me some feedback. What about you? I ask what they need. What do they need? Exactly. All right. And with inviting people to Jesus, inviting people to church, to your Sunday school class, don't give up just the first time they say no, is what I'm getting at. Good salespeople will go back six, seven, eight, nine times in order to make the sale and to get the business and to find out what the customer needs, okay? Somebody that's lost needs <coughs> Jesus, needs forgiveness, needs purpose in life, okay? Don't just give up. Number two down there, people who are opposed to the gospel are not opposed to ice cream. Mm -hmm. Huh? All right. Really? You think? Absolutely. You know, a lot of people are not opposed to ice cream. I see them at Baskin Robbins all the time. Sure. In other words, invite him to the party. Invite him to the party. Okay. People are looking for, are not just looking for a friendly church. They're looking for friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lost people are not, they're not looking for a friendly church for the most part. Now, if the church is friendly, that's great. But even <coughs> more so, they're looking for a friend that loves them, that cares for them. That, uh, and so that may mean going the second mile and they come on Easter Sunday, like I said a while ago, take them out to lunch or something of that nature, okay? But they're not just looking for a friendly church. They're looking for friends. Thoughts on this right here? This, this is a little, little bit out there from the norm, okay? Any thoughts on that? The idea of building relationships. And being tenacious, yes. Well, when you mentioned about inviting people to come for Easter, does it mean that the church need to do something special, you know, prepare for the new people to come, not like a regular Sunday worship? We we'll do something special to, you know, accommodate them. It's a great people. question. Yeah. Great question, and as Sunday school leaders, um, <coughs> You might think about that. You might talk about it. Uh, uh, for sure, have somebody at the door greeting people as they come in. That's a little something that, that you can do. Uh, maybe you may already do that. I don't know. Probably do. Okay, great. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Easter Sunday needs to be something special. Not just, okay, it's Easter. Let's, you know, blah, blah. It needs to be something special. And in your Sunday school class, as you share... The idea of, of your class inviting friends, inviting neighbors, uh, might be some somebody, especially in a ladies' class or a couples' class, uh, somebody bakes some fresh homemade banana nut bread, you know, to go with some coffee or whatever. I don't know. Just uh, use your own uh, own imagination. But yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah. No question. Yes. How do you boy the you mentioned that you're pulling out bait and switch situation. They think you're going to park me when you dump that you're going to church. They well, think, here's, I think you can trick them. I understand like that. that, yeah, and some people may think that. But if you invite your friend, and that person really is your friend, then they won't think of bait and switch because you are a friend. 
and you're genuine and you have their trust. Okay, does that make sense? That makes sense. And uh, but uh, yeah, if if you have a big, we'll give away, you know, bicycles and a kid that brings ten people, you know, that, you know that's <laughs> and that's Bible school. That you know that's nothing wrong with doing that for vacation Bible school, but uh, you know on an Easter thing it's probably probably not good. But if you focus on relationships and friendships. Uh, you won't have the bait and switch type thing. It, it just it won't exist because it's a friend. Now, if you don't ever talk to your friend again for another six months, then they'll think, well, okay, yeah, he, you know. But if you continue to be that friend and continue to follow up and continue to uh, love on that person, then that's the key. That's the key. But that's a good thought. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Know the spiritual gifts in your own personal spiritual gift and the spiritual gifts of others. <clears throat> How many of you right now, in Romans, the 12th chapter, there are seven main spiritual gifts that make up the body of Christ. That make up the body of Christ, okay? How many of you know what your number one lead spiritual gift is? Okay. Got a few. Got a few, maybe. Yeah, okay. All right. Real quick, let me go through them real quick. Uh, one of the spiritual gifts is uh, prophecy. Now, this is not telling the future. This is prophecy meaning, thus saith the Lord, it's right and wrong, it's black and white. Okay? And we, there's people, my wife is a spiritual gift of prophecy. Uh, there's people in the church that have this, this uh, spiritual gift. People in the church have the spiritual gift of teaching. Now, you don't have to have the spiritual gift of teaching to teach, but, but it helps. Spiritual gift of teaching loves studying the Word. Okay? A person loves studying the Word. They love to dig. And even, they love studying it more than they do presenting it. Okay? Right, that's just some kind of thing. Okay, next. Spiritual gift of giving. A person with a spiritual gift of giving, and we're talking about money, also has a spiritual gift of making money. Okay? For example, if you've got three kids needing uh, a couple of hundred bucks to go to camp this summer, a person with a spiritual gift of, of giving in your church, if he hears about that need, guess what? They go like, 600 bucks, yeah, I can write a check for that. They'll come down and he'll write a check for those three kids. No big deal. Okay, because he has a spiritual gift of giving. A person has a spiritual gift of giving, you know, he's worried about if the church has a debt. He can pay this debt off. Talk more concerned about finances. They usually have the spiritual gift of making money. Okay? All right. Person spiritual gift of encouragement. That's me. I'm kind of a cheerleader. I'm going to pat you on the back. I want to encourage you. I'm here today to encourage you to have a great Sunday school class. Take two or three of these nuggets that I'm talking about. You don't have to take all of them. Just, just one or two nuggets. If that's all you get from being here today, and you apply them to your class and your teaching, then that's going to help you. I want to encourage you to use those things, new things, to take your Sunday school class to a new level, okay? And at the end of the session here, in about an hour, I'm going to come around, I'm going to ask each of you, in a word or a phrase, tell me the most important <coughs> thing you've got from being here today. So I want you to kind of even now, let's begin to think about it. This is a good tool for you as a teacher to use in your class every now and then. The end of your Sunday school class, hey, what'd you get from being here today? Well, I didn't realize Susie was had cancer, and I'm gonna pray for her. You know, one thing, one thing you got from being here, okay? And that's what all I'm asking you to do today. I'm, we're, I'm giving you several different nuggets, but if you can just get one or two, take to your class and kind of help your class grow a little bit or become more healthy, then that that'll make a difference. Where was I? Spiritual gift of giving, spiritual gift of encouragement, spiritual gift of organization, leadership. Person with the gift of, of organization takes a project and gathers around some people and gets the project done. Okay? They're leaders. They initiate. Spiritual gift of mercy. On the average, a church, 40% of the congregation 
will have a strong spiritual gift of mercy. They love on people. They care for people. They visit the nursing home. They'll go to the hospital. You know, somebody's sick, they'll send them a card. They'll pray for them. You know, spiritual gift of mercy is so important. And there's people in your Sunday school who have that spiritual gift of mercy. And yet you have a spiritual gift of prophecy or teaching, and you're not very high on mercy. <laughs> and sometimes there's a conflict. And that's okay. You've got to work through that. Let's see. Uh, the spiritual gift of the teaching, giving, mercy. Serving. Serving. Thank you. Spiritual gift of serving. When this is done today, uh, the people with the spiritual gift of serving will put all these chairs back where they belong. <laughs> Won't even have to be asked. That's just what they'll do. That's who they are. They love to serve. I was, I was doing a spiritual gift survey in a Sunday school class about this size in my church in Paducah. And I did it in, in an hour. I did it really faster than uh, normal. It takes about an hour and a half. But anyways, was, and they filled out this little survey deal, the analysis sheet, which helped them to know what their spiritual gift was. And I got over, there's one guy sitting right here by the door. I said, hey, Brother Aaron, Brother Aaron, come here. I said, man, look at my sheet. I don't, I don't think I have a spiritual gift. <laughs> I said, well, man, are you saved? <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, I know I'm saved. Well, then you've got a spiritual gift. There's a, a sheet. I took the sheet up and service was off the chart. I mean, it was way up here. I said, man, you got the spiritual gift of service. He said, service, what's that? He said, I said, well, tell me what... What have you done around the church recently? Well, me and a couple guys last week, we went down to the bus barn and we straightened it up and cleaned it up and hauled off a bunch of junk. And I said, man, that's a spiritual gift of service. <laughs> you were serving by just doing something that was needed to be done. He said, you think so? <laughs> I said, I know so. I know so. And it, just, it was like a light came on that he realized, okay, I've got a spiritual gift of service. Whenever a church understands their spiritual giftedness in a leadership like this, even in a Sunday school class, class will come alive. And this right here is from, uh, not Katrina, but the one they had in Dallas in, uh, in Houston a couple years ago. We took a disaster relief team down there, worked for a week, saw two people come to know Christ. And, uh, but this was the stuff piled up as we drove along the highway. And, uh, we were serving. We were organizing. Uh, we were evangelizing. Evangelism is the last spiritual gift. People that have a spiritual gift of evangelism, man, they, they will share the gospel with a fire plug. I'm serious. They love to share the gospel. And we need these people in our church. Okay, get people involved in ministry in the area of their giftedness. The area of their giftedness. Okay? Uniquely used spiritual gift inventory is something that I do uh, with churches and help them understand it. Do it about an hour and a half and when you walk out you will know your lead spiritual gift. Okay. Alright, discover. Y'all not listening very fast, okay? Discover. What's it mean to discover God's Word? Paul and Sunday school teacher, you need to teach a halfway decent lesson each Sunday. Just halfway decent. That's all. But, you've got to do it every Sunday. Every Sunday. And it just has to be halfway decent. You don't have to be Chuck Swindoll or Adrian Rogers or, or uh, Steve Gaines or anybody like that. But you do have to teach a halfway decent lesson, Bible study lesson, okay? <clears throat> All right, one, ask yourself, is it biblical? Is this lesson biblical? Am I, is it from the Word? Yes, it is. Let me read a passage right here. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we're here today. Because God's Word is vital. 
Make your Sunday school lesson clear, but not too clear. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Clear, but not too clear. Does anybody know what a Bereans were back in the New Testament, Old Testament? The uh, the, were? The, they were the church that Paul uh, exhorted to check the stuff that he was saying. Make sure just don't believe it. I'm, you can believe in faith, but check what I'm saying and check over what I'm telling you. Could, and I want you to be sure that what I'm saying is correct. Stand up and say that one more time. <laughs> Stand up and say that one more time because that's exactly what a Berean was. Um, it was. They were the people from the Berean church, or the church of Berea, that um, Paul exhorted to make sure that they checked on the things that he said and just don't take it upon faith because they wanted to make sure that they had the, the gospel and the message that he was trying to convey to everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Give her a hand. What's your name? Diana. Diana. <laughs> Wonderful job. Wonderful job. That's exactly what? That's what she does. What do you do? I'm a teacher by trade. You're a Marine. You're a Marine. What do you do? I teach second graders at Snowden. Bless you. Snowden? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's real close to where my two yeah, grandson, yeah. grandsons live. Yeah. Cool. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. A Marine, somebody who kind of digs in and makes sure that, hey, so what Paul, Paul said that faith is that salvation is by grace, not through faith. Let's, let's, let's. Let's see what, what, what Jesus said. And, and you want to train your people in your Sunday school class to do the same. This couple that I mentioned that uh, uh, worked all night and was saved and came and said, Hey, Howard, I want you to start a, a new class because we can't come in the, day th in the morning. Uh, they started coming at that 5 o'clock class. And Danny was his name. And every now and then, because Danny was a brand new Christian. <coughs> He literally had not been to church in 30 years. Literally had not been to church. Not in but Danny, he, I mean, he was like a sponge. He was like a sponge. And he, I'd be teaching along and he'd raise his hand. And he'd ask some off-the-wall question. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, when, when you're a sponge and you're doing the faith, you have some off-the-wall questions. Danny had asked this question and I, you know, I'd answer them. I'd answer them. After about three or four months of this, and it was like every Sunday, every lesson, Finally, I came across this brilliant idea. I said, hey, Danny, man, that's a great question. Uh, why don't you research it this week, Google it, whatever, and get back with us next Sunday? And the class kind of laughed and snickered a little bit. But Danny said, okay, I'll do that. And he did. He did, man. He got his computer and he researched the question and he got it. And he would print out two or three sheets and he would give it to us the next Sunday. Well, what that did, that caused him to research and become a student of the Bible. And also, it kept other people in the class from asking stupid questions. <laughs> and teachers, guess what? Sometimes you need something like that to keep people from asking stupid questions. And if somebody does ask a question, it's kind of... Now, now I'm not going to do that to you today. But, you know, <laughs> uh, that's a good way to... Uh, to get people, keep them from asking some off the wall, like, you know, did Adam have an able, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, is the Sunday school lesson, is it application oriented? Does it help? Is the lesson I'm teaching, does it help that person during the week? Does it help that young mom who has three kids, she's got to get ready? For school on Monday morning doesn't help her get out of bed and get on with her work. Doesn't help the guy that's got all kinds of crud going on at work. Doesn't help him make a difference and have a good attitude at work. Is it applicable? Is the lesson applicable? Uh, what application are you giving in this Bible study lesson? Must be interesting. Must, must be interesting. I've told a couple stories here today about Mike Thurston and a duck hunting and him getting saved. And I told another story about a couple, you know, that hadn't been in church in 30 years and, and about to divorce and they come and I talked to him a little bit and, and we started at 5 o'clock, you know. I told a couple interesting stories to get your attention. You know those stories. Jesus told stories. The parables. What were the parables? Stories. Absolutely. Jesus knew that our minds are built in such a way that we will remember the story 
and we will remember the principle of the story. But if we just tell some principle, some idea, some truth from the Word, and, that, and that's still very important, but if we tell a story behind that truth, then it's locked in. We remember it. Okay? Uh, make it interesting. Like I said, you don't have to be Chuck Swindoll or Steve Gaines or whatever, but you do have to teach a halfway decent lesson each Sunday morning. Nothing else will do. Okay? Is that free any of you? Have y'all been studying six, eight, ten hours a week going to your lesson? Yeah, some of you do. Okay. Let me free you up. About three hours. About three hours all you need. But you do need three to four hours. And people do need different different times, okay? But, uh, okay, let's go to the next. Okay, I love this. The teacher always learns the most. Guess what? That's why, even though I was a minister, I still taught a Sunday school class. I still preached. Because I know, as a preacher, as a teacher, I learn the most. So how many of you actually are already teaching a Sunday school class or teaching like uh, Juana's or something like that? Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, okay, great. Some of you didn't raise your hand. Now you may be class president or you may be here kind of inquiring. But I challenge you to raise your hand. Find you an assistant teacher in your class. Now, if you're teaching one-year-olds and three-year-olds and first graders, it's kind of hard. But get a mama, get a daddy to come in there and assist you every now and then, okay? And the idea is that you are training somebody to help you. You're training somebody to actually start a new class, maybe. As a minister of education, I always found it easier to find two teachers than it was to enlist one. Because you find two teachers, they're teaching every other Sunday. You totally do away with burnout. But if you can get two teachers to start a new class, it's a whole lot easier than finding one person. But if you raise your hand while you go, find you an assistant teacher. And this summer, take a month off. Say, hey, you got it. That's what I would do. I'd go start a brand new class, you know, me and another buddy, we'd be teaching away every other Sunday, that kind of thing. And, and then, you know, about a Sometime in the summertime, hey, okay, you got it for six weeks. What? No, man. Yeah, you got. I got stuff I got to do. I'm on vacation. You know. <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't sign up. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. You can handle it. You know. And they would. They would be able to handle it. And then I'd go on. I'll start another class. And then all of a sudden, they had a the class by themselves. That's how. You, that's how you start. Teacher's a primary learner. With the attitude of the, I've not arrived. I've not arrived as a teacher just because I'm teaching God's Word. Or someone said facilitating this morning. I'm the facilitator. I'm not the teacher. That's fine. That's still good. But you have the attitude, I have not arrived. We are learning together. We are growing together. And then as I leave the class on a Sunday morning, I'm usually the last one to leave. As I turn the light off, I ask myself the question, so what? What I said in class, how I taught today, did it make a difference? Let me, Lord, touch my heart, help me to evaluate, so far. Was I just up here flapping my jaws? Did anybody seem like they were touched by the Word, changed by the Word? So what? That's a good question to ask. As you leave, just think back to kind of do a, a little evaluation. i learn from our past, but don't stay in it. It's okay to tell stories on yourself. Just don't get too... <laughs> it's not a therapy session. But we've all blown it. We've all done things we wish we hadn't done. You know? And sometimes, in a discreet way, it's okay to share those things because we see how God is honored and God is glorified through our mistakes, and I've always found that when a teacher does something like this, you don't have to do it very often, but and a pastor even, as, as they're preaching or as they're teaching away, if you say something like this, 
Folks, I, I just want you to know that this week I really had a tough week. It was awful, and I didn't handle things very well. You can hear a pin drop because of the transparency of the teacher or the pastor or whatever. You don't want to do that every Sunday. <laughs> but if you're struggling and say, hey, folks, I need your help. I need your prayers. Uh, in a <laughs> okay, here we go. I was, I've got a men's group that I go to on Wednesday nights. There's about a dozen of us there at the church. And I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And about six months ago, we were talking about stuff and marriage and all this kind of stuff. And and I just said something like this. I said, fellas, please, you guys got to pray for me. Because my wife and I, right before I left the house, we had pretty much a knockdown drag out. And, and seriously, that really happened. There weren't any blows. You know, I, I wasn't bruised or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but those men that night, oh my goodness. They began to open up and share, and because of my transparency and my trust of them, you know, they began to share. Hey, and things ain't very good in my house either, you know. And it, just, it was just, it was a very healthy discussion. And again, you don't want your Sunday school class to become a therapy session, but every now and then, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, if you can be honest, transparent, uh, that trust level in your class will go, go real high. But you don't want to stay in your past. You want to learn from it. Do not assume interest, but create interest. I've tried to do that today by creating interest. Just in this past past little three or four minutes, I was trying to create interest. Okay, And, and I can tell you all were right there. Uh, but you, you do things, you tell things, you, you have uh, to, to create interest. Okay, pastor did a great job of sharing this point here this morning. He said, uh, get to know your students, get to know their needs, get to know their hurts. Uh, and somehow, you, you as a class, as a teacher, you can begin to help in those hurts, those heartaches, those uh, things that go on with your class every day. You re realize you have a new class every Sunday? You do. You may have the same people you had last Sunday, but still you've got a new class because things have happened to those class members that week that have changed them. Maybe at work, health-wise, family-wise, whatever. You've got a new class every Sunday. And if you realize that, you can... Uh, here's what we do with prayer requests. And I, I challenge you to do this if you're not already doing it. A lot of times, you know, for years I have prayer requests at the beginning of Sunday school class and we take 20 minutes. 25 minutes doing prayer requests, you know. And that was fine, it was great, it was wonderful, but then it did leave me about 30 minutes for Bible study. And, you know, Sunday school is about Bible study. So I began to pass a piece of paper around on a clipboard, each person, I said, write down your prayer request. And at the end of the class, we'll share them and we'll send them out email. Even people who aren't here will know about your prayer request. Whoa! That opened up all kinds of time for Bible study. And people began to write down their prayer requests. And, and most of the time, just one sentence, one line, you know. A lot of people, they just pass the clipboard on around. And uh, But if you do that, I promise you, it'll make a difference. And people will share things on the clipboard. Maybe they didn't want to share in public. But I challenge you to do that if you're not already doing that. So do you go ahead and start your Bible study while the clip is coming yes. out of your own? Yes, whatever time you're supposed to start, start, boom. And you may just start with half the class, but after a while, I promise you, you know, where we get out, hey, Howard's starting right at 9 o'clock, he starts at 9.02. And uh, you, you, people will, will be there. But yeah, you pass the, pass the clipboard around. At the end of the class, you have your prayer person, your prayer leader of your class, stand up, maybe read these, 